What did Jesus really says part 3? 1.2 Muslim Perspective Note, the rest of chapter 1 is an expansion of the original response to Mr. J's letter, thank you Mr. J for your most thought-provoking letter. In what is to follow I have striven to avoid objectionable or disrespectful wording. This is an academic exchange and not a slugfest. I am however human. If one or two cases have slipped by me then I apologize in advance for them. They were not intentional. I also realized that this is quite a lengthy response for someone to read in one sitting. However, I ask the reader to try to do so and not to pass judgment until they have managed to receive a complete picture. Now, the response. The three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all purport to share one fundamental concept, belief in God as the supreme being, the creator and sustainer of the universe. Known as, Toid, in Islam, this concept of oneness of God was stressed by Moses in the biblical passage known as the, Shema, or the Jewish creed of faith. Here, O Israel the Lord our God is one Lord, Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. It was repeated word for word approximately 1,500 years later by Jesus when he said. The first of all the commandments is, Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Mark 12 verse 29. Muhammad came along approximately 600 years later, bringing the same message again, and your God is one God, there is no God but He, the Qur'an, al-Baqarah, 2163. Christianity has digressed from the concept of the oneness of God, however, into a vague and mysterious doctrine that was formulated during the 4th century CE, see historical details in chapter 2.2.5. This doctrine, which continues to be the source of controversy both within and without the Christian religion, is known as the doctrine of the Trinity. Simply put, the Christian doctrine of the Trinity states that God is the union of three divine persons, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, in one divine being. Christian sects are many and varied. However, the majority of Christians around the world believe in the following four basic concepts. 1. The Trinity, 2. The divine sonship of Jesus, 3. The original sin, and 4. The death of the Son of God, on the cross in atonement for the original sin of Adam. Everything else is pretty much relegated into the background. A Christian can be saved and enter heaven by simply believing in the above creeds. According to St. Paul, the previous law and commandments of God are worthless. This simple belief will guarantee for all comers a place in heaven, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Romans 3 verse 28. Christianity as it currently stands is the interpretation of St. Paul of what he personally thinks that Christianity should be. Muslims are told that the message of Jesus, peace be upon him, was directed towards the Jews alone as verified in the Bible, Matthew 15. 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The verses wherein he is claimed to have told his disciples to preach to the whole world are now recognized as later insertions, we will get into this in a little more detail in chapter 6.10. God Almighty never intended for it to become the religion of the masses as he intended Islam to be. There is much internal evidence in the Bible to support this claim. Christianity as it stands today has been reduced to an interpretation of the words of Jesus, peace be upon him, within the context of what Paul taught rather than the other way around which is the way it should be. We would expect Christianity to be the teachings of Jesus and that the words of Paul and everyone else would be accepted or rejected according to their conformity to these, Jesuit, teachings. However, we will notice in what follows that Jesus never in his lifetime mentioned an original sin, or an atonement. He never asked anyone to worship him, neither did he ever claim to be part of a trinity or anything else. His words and actions are those of a loyal messenger of God who faithfully and faultlessly followed the commands of his Lord and only told his followers to do the same and to worship God alone, John. For 21, John for verse 23, Matthew 4 colon 10, Luke for colon 8, etc. Just one of the countless examples of this placement of the words of Paul above the words of Jesus can be seen in the following analysis. Jesus, peace be upon him, is claimed to have been prepared for his sacrifice on the cross from the beginning of time and was a willing victim, otherwise they would have to claim that God is a sadistic and torturous God. However, whenever Jesus was asked about the path to eternal life he consistently told his followers to only keep the commandments and nothing more, Luke 18 verses 18 to 24, Matthew 19 verses 16 to 21, John 14. 15, John 15 verse 10. Not once did he himself ever mention an original sin or a redemption. 
even when pressed for the path to perfection, he only told his followers to sell their belongings. He departed leaving his followers with a very dire threat, Matthew 5. 18-19, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Obviously, heaven and earth have not yet passed. The fact that you are reading this book bears witness to this very simple fact. So Jesus is telling us that so long as creation exists, the commandments will be required from his followers. Anyone who will dare to say otherwise, until the end of time, will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus had foreseen mankind's attempt to distort and annul his commandments, the commandments of Moses, who, which he had taught his followers to keep and himself had kept faithfully till the crucifixion, and was warning his followers in no uncertain terms to be wary of all those who would attempt to do so. Not long after, Jesus departs. Now Saul of Tarsus, St. Paul, a man who never met Jesus, peace be upon him, comes along. After a lifetime of persecuting the followers of Jesus and killing them, Paul sees the light, receives a vision from Jesus and takes it upon himself to explain what Jesus really meant. Paul claims that the law of God is worthless, decaying and ready to vanish away and faith in the crucifixion is the only requirement for a Christian to enter heaven, Romans 3 verse 28, Hebrews 8. 13 etc. Who do Christians listen to, Jesus or Paul? They listen to Paul. They take the words of Paul literally and then, interpret, the words of Jesus within the context of the words of Paul. No one takes the words of Jesus literally and explains the words of Paul within the context of Jesus' words. According to this system of explaining the words of Jesus within the context of Paul's teachings, Jesus never actually means what he says but is constantly speaking in riddles which are not to be taken literally. Even when people attempt to cite the words of Jesus as confirming the teachings of Paul with regard to the original sin, the atonement, the divine sonship, etc. They never bring clear and decisive words where Jesus actually confirms these things. Instead, they say such things as, when Jesus spoke of the Exodus he was really speaking of the atonement, or so forth. Are we to believe that Paul is the only one who can say what is on his mind clearly and decisively while Jesus, peace be upon him, is not capable of articulating what he means clearly and decisively? but requires interpreters to explain the true meaning of what he said, and to explain how, when he spoke of the commandments. He was not talking of the commandments, but of a spiritual commandment and that they will now tell you what this spiritual commandment is that Jesus never managed to talk clearly about. It is interesting to note that Jesus was not talking in riddles when he commanded his followers to keep the commandments but was talking of the actual physical commandments of Moses. This can be clearly seen by reading for instance Luke 18. 20 where Jesus spells out in no uncertain terms what he means by, keep the commandments. In the past, we have posed the following points to Christian clergy. 1. According to you, Jesus is supposed to have been prepared for the atonement from the beginning of time. He should know that it is coming. 2. Whenever he was asked about the path to eternal life, i.e. Luke 18 verses 18 to 24 etc., he consistently told his followers to only keep the commandments, just as he had kept my father's commandments, dot etc. 3. Even when he was proceed for more he merely told his followers that to be perfect they need only sell their belongings. 4. Not once did he mention an atonement or an original sin. 5. The commandments he spoke about were the commandments of Moses and not some spiritual commandments. This can be seen in the text itself where Jesus, who, explicitly spells out some of the commandments of Moses one by one. 6. Saint Paul, a disciple of a disciple, is the one who is followed by Christianity and not Jesus. Jesus' teachings are explained within the context of Paul's teachings and not vice versa. Whenever we presented these points to a member of the Christian clergy we would always be greeted with a response such as, well, ah. Uh, don't take Jesus' words literally ah. Uh. Getting back to the matter at hand. The reader will notice in Mr. J's response a surprising absence of certain very fundamental verses usually quoted by any Christian man or woman off the street in defense of the Trinity. And other issues. The reader may further surmise that Mr. J might not be well versed enough in the Bible to have referred to these verses. This is far from the case. His occupation requires that he know those verses. 
The fact of the matter is that we have had an ongoing correspondence with Mr. J for a number of months now which he has now asked us to publicize. In this correspondence, many of these fundamental verses were dealt with in detail and refuted for various reasons. This is why he did not quote them here. However, in order that all may benefit from this information we will quote these same verses that he has elected not to. We will also tackle the other verses he has presented. 1.2.1, Blind Faith, or, Prove All Things. Before actually getting down to our response, let us first establish the ground rules. All Bibles in existence today tell us that Christians are taught by Jesus, peace be upon him, himself, and Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Mark 12 verses 29 to 30. They are also told, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21. And, for God is not the author of confusion, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33. So, contrary to the teachings of most members of the clergy, Jesus, peace be upon him, did not want his followers to believe everything they were told on, blind faith. But he wanted his followers to believe, with all thy mind. He wanted us to think in order to protect his words from corruption. Let us comply with the teaching of Allah's elect messenger, Jesus, and see where the truth and our minds will lead us. 1.2.2, the, Trinity, or 1 plus 1 plus 1 is equal to 1. The myth of the, Trinity, as originally fabricated three centuries after the departure of. Jesus, see historical details at end of this chapter, and taught to Christians ever since is the merging of three entities into one while remaining three distinct entities. In other words, three bodies fold, or blend, or merge into one body so that they become one entity while at the same time exhibiting the characteristics of three distinct and separate entities. It is described as a mystery. The first definition of the Trinity was put forth in the 4th century as follows. We worship one God in the Trinity, and Trinity in unity, for there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Ghost is all one. They are not three gods. But one God. The whole three persons are co-eternal and co-equal, he therefore that will be saved must thus think of the Trinity. Excerpts from the Athanasian Creed. When the church speaks of worship, God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost are claimed to be one being. Otherwise they would have to explain such verses as Isaiah 43 verses 10 to 11. However, when they speak of the death of God, it is Jesus, peace be upon him, who is claimed to have died and not God or the Trinity. Now the three are separate. When God is described as having begotten a son it is not the Trinity nor Jesus which has begotten, but a distinctly separate being from the other two. There are many such examples. 1.2.2.1 From the Bible Standpoint Matthew 28 verse 19, 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4 to 6, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14, and Jude 20 to 21. How someone could refer to such verses as requiring a trinity is beyond comprehension. Do any of these verses say, God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost are the same being, or, God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost are one and the same, etc.? Just because the words, God, Jesus, and Holy Ghost appear in one verse does not mean this verse requires a trinity. Or, merging of three into one. Even if this verse also contains the word, one, this still does not necessarily require a trinity. For example, if I say, Joe, Jim, and Frank speak one language, this is not the same as saying, Joe, Jim, and Frank are one person. Let us clarify this with examples. 1, Matthew 28 verse 19. If President George Bush told General Norman Schwarzkopf to, go ye therefore, and speak to the Iraqis, chastising them in the name of the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. Does this require that these three are one physical entity? They may be one in purpose and in their goals but this does in no way require that they are merged into one physical entity. Also remember that the, Great Commission, as narrated in the Gospel of Mark, bears no mention of the Father, Son and or Holy Ghost, see Mark 16 verse 15. As we shall see in chapter 2, Christian historians readily admit that the Bible was the object of continuous correction and addition to bring it in line with established beliefs.
they present many documented cases where words were inserted into a given verse to validate a given doctrine. Tom Harper, former religion editor of the Toronto Star says in his book For Christ's Sake, pp. 102, all but the most conservative of scholars agree that at least the latter part of this command was inserted later. 2, 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4 to 6. If I were to say, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Santa Claus. There are different kinds of service, but the same government. There are different kinds of working. But the same God works all of them in all men. Do God, the US government and Santa Claus now form another, Trinity. The same verse which moments ago required a merging of three gods into a, Trinity, can now be understood without the need for a Trinity. Is it impossible to receive, gifts, services, and, works, except from any person? Once again, we see that it is necessary to spend a little more time actually reading the verses in question in order to not read into them statements that are not there. Why does everything have to be so abstract? If this is the true nature of God then why can't the Bible just come out and say, God? Jesus and the Holy Ghost are physically joined in one being, or, God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost are one and the same. Is this so very hard? Look at how much less space this would require. Look at how infinitely more clear and decisive that would be. Look at the clear-cut decisiveness of Deuteronomy 4 verse 39, Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart, that the Lord he is God in heaven above, and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. God does not philosophize and speak all the way around matters. He speaks clearly and in no uncertain terms so that there can be no doubt as to what he meant. If there was a trinity why would he not simply just come out and say so, just as clearly and decisively as he does when he speaks about his uniqueness? Think about it. 3, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14. If I say, may the genius of Einstein, the philosophy of Freud, and the strength of Schwarzenegger be with you all, does this require all three to be joined in a trinity? Does it require that Einstein is Freud, or a different side of Freud? Does it require that Freud is Schwarzenegger, or a different side of Schwarzenegger? 4. Jude 20-21 If a man on his deathbed told his only son, but you, dear son, build yourself up in your strength and strive in good works. Keep yourself in my love as you wait for the fullness of time to guide you to manhood, show us how these verses require a trinity. Go back and apply this same logic to the original verse. Deuteronomy 4 verse 39 requires the uniqueness of God. There are no two ways about it. It is very clear, decisive, and to the point. The explicit, and not the, hidden, meaning is quite clear and direct. Show me just one verse of the Bible that is similarly decisive about the trinity. All of these verses require you to really strain the words and stretch their meaning to arrive at any merging of three into one. With regard to your description of the Trinity please read the analysis of the original sin and the redemption below. An interesting point is that when people try to force a Trinity upon a certain verse of the Bible they always do it with the New Testament and not the Old Testament. Why is that? Did the countless prophets of the Old Testament not know about the Trinity? Did God not see fit to tell the Jews about the Trinity? Think about it. When someone speaks to someone else about a specific matter, they usually spend the majority of their time explaining the major issues and much less time on side issues. For instance, if I wanted to give someone my favorite recipe for chicken parmesan I would spend most of my time speaking about the ingredients, their amounts, their order of combination. The amount of time needed to cook each one and so on. I would spend very little time, comparatively, talking about how to set the table or what color bowl to serve it in. When comparing this observation to the Bible, we find that for a matter of such profound importance, the Trinity is never mentioned in the Bible at all. Sound preposterous? Read on. The verse most often quoted by almost every Christian around the world in defense of the Trinity is the verse of 1 John 5. 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This is the type of clear, decisive, and to the point verse we were asking for. However, this verse is now universally recognized as being a later insertion of the Church and all recent versions of the Bible. Such as the Revised Standard Version and the New Revised Standard Version, etc.
have unceremoniously expunged this verse from their pages. Why is this? The scripture translator Benjamin Wilson gives the following explanation for this action in his emphatic diaglot. Mr. Wilson says, This text concerning the heavenly witness is not contained in any Greek manuscript which was written earlier than the 15th century. It is not cited by any of the ecclesiastical writers, not by any of early Latin fathers even when the subjects upon which they treated would naturally have lead them to appeal to its authority. It is therefore evidently spurious. Others, such as the late Dr. Herbert W. Armstrong argued that they were added to the Latin Vulgate edition of the Bible during the heat of the controversy between Rome, Dr. Arius, and God's people. Whatever the reason, this verse is now universally recognized as an insertion and discarded. Since the Bible contains no verses validating a trinity, therefore, centuries after the departure of Jesus, God decided to inspire someone to insert this verse in order to clarify the true nature of God as being a trinity. Notice that mankind was being inspired as to how to clarify the Bible centuries after the departure of Jesus. People continued to put words in the mouths of Jesus, his disciples, and even God himself with no reservations whatsoever. They were being inspired, see chapter 2. If these people were being inspired by God then why did they need to put these words into other people's mouths? Why did they not just openly say, God inspired me and I will add a chapter to the Bible in my name? Also, why did God need to wait till after the departure of Jesus to inspire his true nature? Why not let Jesus, peace be upon him, say it himself? It was Sir Isaac Newton who made public this forged insertion. Of all the manuscripts now extant, above fourscore in number, some of which are more than 1,200 years old, the orthodox copies of the Vatican, of the Complutensian editors, of Robert Stevens are becoming invisible and the two manuscripts of Dublin and Berlin are unworthy to form an exception, in the 11th and 12th centuries, the Bibles were corrected by Lanfranc, Archbishop of Canterbury, and by Nicholas, a cardinal and librarian of the Roman Church, Secundum Orthodoxum Fidem. Notwithstanding these corrections, the passage is still wanting in 25 Latin manuscripts, the oldest and fairest. Two qualities seldom united, except in manuscripts, the three witnesses have been established in our Greek testaments by the prudence of Erasmus, the honest bigotry of the Complutensian editors. The typographical fraud, or error, of Robert Stevens in the placing of a crotchet and the deliberate falsehood, or strange misapprehension, of Theodore Beza. Gibbon. Decline and fall of the Roman Empire, 4, p. 418. Such comparatively unimportant matters as the description of Jesus, peace be upon him, riding an ass, or was it a colt, or was it an ass and a colt? C.42 in the table of chapter 2.2, into Jerusalem are spoken about in great detail since they are the fulfillment of a prophesy. For instance, in Mark 11 verses 2 to 10 we read, And saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him, and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way, and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met, and they loose and certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye, loosing the colt? And they said unto them even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees, and strawed them in the, and they that went before, and they that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, blessed be the kingdom of our father David, that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Also see Luke 19. 30-38 which has a similar detailed description of this occurrence. On the other hand, the Bible is completely free of any description of the Trinity, which is supposedly a description of the very nature of the one who wrote this ass. Who is claimed to be the only Son of God, and who allegedly died for the sins of all of mankind. Which is more important to Christian faith, the Trinity or the description of an ass? Another verse quoted in defense of the Trinity is the verse of John 1 verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
1. First of all, these words are acknowledged to be every erudite Christian scholar of the Bible as the words of another Jew, Philo of Alexandria, who claimed no divine inspiration for them, and who had written them long before John or Jesus were born. Grolier's Encyclopedia has the following to say under the heading, Logos, the word. Heraclitus was the earliest Greek thinker to make Logos a central concept. In the New Testament, the Gospel according to St. John gives a central place to Logos. The biblical author describes the Logos as God, the creative word, who took on flesh in the man Jesus Christ. Many have traced John's conception to Greek origins, perhaps through the intermediacy of eclectic texts like the writings of Philo of Alexandria. 2. Internal evidence provides serious doubt as to whether the Apostle John the son of Zebedee wrote this gospel himself. In the Dictionary of the Bible by John Mackenzie, we read, A. Foyer notes that authorship here may be taken loosely. Such claims are based on such verses as 21-24, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things, and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Also see 21 20, 13-23, 19-26, 20-2, 21-7, and 21-20-23. The disciple who Jesus loved, according to the church is John himself, but the author speaks of him as a different person. In other words, what we have here is a gospel which someone wants us to think was written by the Apostle John, but which in fact was not written by him. 41 What did Jesus really say? 3 The gospel of John was written at or near Ephesus between the years 110 and 115, some say 95 to 100, of the Christian era by this, or these, unknown authors. According to R. H. Charles, Alfred Loisy, Robert Eiler, and other scholars of Christian history, John of Zebedee was beheaded by Agrippa I in the year 44 CE, long before the fourth gospel was written. For C.J. Kadu writes in The Life of Jesus. The speeches in the fourth gospel, even apart from the earlier messianic claim, are so different from those in the synoptics and so like the comments of the fourth evangelist himself that both cannot be equally reliable as records of what Jesus said, literary veracity in ancient times did not forbid, as it does now, the assignment of fictitious speeches to historical characters. The best ancient historians made a practice of composing and assigning such speeches this way. 5. Even if we are to take this verse as authentic, then we must notice the following. In the original Greek manuscripts, did the disciple John speak Greek, the first occurrence of the word, God, is the Greek word, beov. Hophios, which means, the God, or, God, with a capital, G, to denote a proper noun. The second occurrence of the word, God, is the Greek, zero eos. Tunthios, meaning, a God, or, God, any God, not necessarily the Almighty. So, if the translators were consistent in their translation, they would have written the above verse as follows. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, if you read the New World Translation of the Bible you will find exactly this wording. If we look at a different verse, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, we find the exact same word is used to describe the devil, however, now the system has dishonestly been reversed. And the devil is, the God of this world. According to the system of the previous verse and the English language. The translation of the description of the devil should also have been written as, God, with a capital, G. If Paul was inspired to use the same word to describe the devil, then why should we change it? Why is this word translated as simply a God when referring to the devil, but translated as the Almighty God when referring to a word? Are we now starting to get a glimpse of how the translation of the Bible took place? The apologists always manage to conveniently sidestep this issue by conveniently forgetting the Hothios Tunthios problem and never mentioning a valid explanation for why one word was translated to different ways in two different verses, but rather, they say, I don't personally like the New World Translation of the Bible, thus. Everything you say is wrong. Even if you do not like the New World Translation, you still have not explained the selective translation. This is blind faith talking here. One of the biggest problems with the Bible as it stands today is that it forces us to look at Hebrew and Aramaic scriptures through Greek and Latin glasses as seen by people who are neither Jews, Greeks, nor Romans. All of the so-called, original, manuscripts available today are written in Greek. The verses of John 1 verse 1 is exactly equivalent to such verses as Psalms 82 verse 6, I have said, ye, the Jews, are gods. 
and all of you are children of the Most High, or Exodus 7 verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. The Jews had no trouble reading such verses while still affirming that there is only one God in existence and vehemently denying the divinity of all but God Almighty. It is the continuous filtration of these manuscripts through different languages and cultures as well as the Roman Catholic Church's extensive efforts to completely destroy all of the original Hebrew. Gospels, see last quarter of this chapter, which has led to this misunderstanding of the verses. If I were an American, and I were to tell, for example, the citizens of China, hit the road men, we would more than likely find countless people beating the street with sticks. Did they understand the words? Yes. Did they understand the meaning? No. Mr. Tom Harper says in the preface to his book. The most significant development since 1986 in this regard has been the discovery of the title, Son of God. In one of the Qumran papyri, Dead Sea Scrolls, used in relation to a person other than Jesus. This simply reinforces the argument made there that to be called the Son of God in a Jewish setting. In the first century is not by any means the same as being identical with God himself. For Christ's sake, pp 12. Please read chapter 13 for more on the Dead Sea Scrolls. 6. In the Qur'an we are told that when God Almighty wills something he merely says to it, be ye, and it is. This is the Islamic viewpoint of, the word. The word, is literally God's utterance, be ye. This is held out by the Bible where 13 verses later in John 1 verse 14 we read. And the word was made flesh. The third verse which Christians claim validates the doctrine of the Trinity is the verse. Of John 10 verse 30, I and my Father are one. This verse, however, is quoted out of context. The complete passage, starting with John 10 verse 23, reads as follows. John 10 verses 23 to 30, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him, and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believed not, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. In divinity? In a holy, trinity? No. They are one in purpose. Just as no one shall pluck them out of Jesus' hand, so shall no one pluck them out of God's hand. Need more proof? Then read John 17 verses 20 to 22, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Is all of mankind also part of the, Trinity? Well, what about the verse, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father? Let us look at the context, John 14 verses 8 to 9, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Philip wanted to see God with his own eyes, but this is impossible since no one can ever do that, John 1. 18. No man hath seen God at any time, see also 1 John 4. 12, etc., so Jesus simply told him that his own actions and miracles should be a sufficient proof of the existence of God without God having to physically come down and let himself be seen every time someone is doubtful. This is equivalent to for example John 8 verse 19, then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me, nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. If we want to insist that when Philip saw Jesus, who, he had actually physically seen God, the father, then this will force us to conclude that John 1 verses 18 and 1 John 4 colon 12, etc. Are all lies. Well, is Philip the only one who ever, saw the Father? Let us read John 6 verse 46, Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Who is this who, is of God, you ask? 
Let us once again ask the Bible, John 8 verse 47, Ye that is of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. And 3 John 1. 11. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Have all people who have done good also physically seen God? Such terminology can be found in many other places, read for example 1 Corinthians 6 verses 15 to 17, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ, and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit, and also Ephesians for verse 6, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. In the New Catholic Encyclopedia, bearing the Nile Obstat and Imprimata, indicating official approval, we read. The formulation, one God in three persons was not solidly established into Christian life and its profession of faith until prior to the end of the 4th century. But it is precisely this formulation that has the first claim to the title the Trinitarian Dogma. Among the Apolistic Fathers, there had been nothing even remotely approaching such a mentality or perspective, emphasis added. So, Jesus' twelve apostles had never heard of any, Trinity. Top Harper writes in his book, For Christ's Sake, what is most embarrassing for the Church is the difficulty of proving any of these statements of dogma from the New Testament documents. You simply cannot find the doctrine of the Trinity set out anywhere in the Bible. St. Paul has the highest view of Jesus' role and person, but nowhere does he call him God. Nor does Jesus himself anywhere explicitly claim to be the second person in the Trinity, wholly equal to his Heavenly Father. As a pious Jew, he would have been shocked and offended by such an idea, this is, in itself bad enough. But there is worse to come. This research has led me to believe that the great majority of regular churchgoers are, for all practical purposes, tritheists. That is, they profess to believe in one God, but in reality they worship three.